Welcome to the HBOT News Network. Today, it's, it's quite an honor and a privilege, um, and I feel blessed to have Dr. Paul Harch with us to discuss hyperbaric oxygen. Dr. Harch has a tremendous um, background in, in hyperbarics, and this is just the kickoff in the beginning of what we hope to be a six-segment series that will delve into the, the, the benefits of hyperbaric oxygen and, and some of the indications and, and injuries or diseases, um, basically, um, and, and conditions that benefit from hyperbaric oxygen. So without further ado, um, welcome Dr. Harch. Thank you, Ed. Pleasure to be here. Well, uh, great to be here. Well, thank you for, 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 for coming here and uh, taking time out of your valuable schedule. I know you have a lot of patients you're working with um, um, all the time and helping them with, uh, with this amazing therapy. Um, one of the uh, areas that, that I, I, I thought or I hope we could start with is that a lot of individuals write in or ask and, and want to understand um, what, is, what is one of the driving, um, what, it, what is the driving um, physiological um, condition that, 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 hyper, that makes hyperbaric oxygen work? And, and I know, and in, 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 in actually just reading your book, and, and I think that um, this is an excellent read, um, The Oxygen Revolution, that, that you wrote. Uh, and, and in The Oxygen Revolution, I feel like it's, it's written for someone like myself. It's, it's written for someone that can, that can really grasp sort of some of the basic biology, although you do get a little deep here at a couple points. I have to read that several times and say, okay, I need to look up some words, but for the most part, you talk about patients, you talk about stories and, and situations, and you, you impart your knowledge. And from what I understand, and, and uh, from my experience you know, over the last eight years in delving into hyperbaric oxygen, is that inflammation is really the, one of the keys to, um, to what hyperbarics helps with. And maybe you could shed some more light on that um, so people can understand that a little better. Sure, well, just a, a quick aside. The, the characterization I've had for that book for all these years is that uh, it was written for the lay public in terms that even doctors can understand. Yes, and it's meaning it, it was directed to the public, uh, but it was really also uh, to educate doctors since this field uh, has been misunderstood by the medical profession uh, for as long as it's been in existence. Um, and I also tell people that the lay people, when they're done reading that, they'll know more than 99% of the physicians in the United States about this therapy because it's not taught in medical schools. It's just not uh, part of our standard armamentarium. Well, you know, just to jump in, when I first met yeah. you um, at, or I heard you at the conference in Albuquerque in 2014, I came home and I got two physicals because I wanted to t ask my doctors if hyperbaric oxygen would help me. And, and both of them said it wouldn't. And so then I went to another doctor, it wasn't a physical, it was a gastro doctor. And, and it was a woman and I, and I said, you know, I need to rephrase that question. And so I asked her, I said, what do you know about hyperbaric oxygen? And she said, um, not much, but if you find something that can help, you know, the the, uh, the gastrointestinal system, um, I'd be very interested in hearing that. And so, so I tell people, don't ask your doctor if it's good for you. Ask them what they know about it. To your point, they don't know much about it. True. And it, I mean, just another elaboration on that. Uh, you know, we're in the habit, and it's unclear exactly why, but I guess with doctors, they're expected to know everything in medicine. And so when you're asked about something you really don't know anything about, you almost feel compelled to give an answer. And, and often, in the case of hyperbaric oxygen therapy, it's a negative one. So you've got an open-minded GI doctor there, and I find the, the female doctors are a little more open-minded than the male doctors, but... Uh, she was, at least was admitting what is the reality. We did a survey, one of our fellows, in 2014, and she called up all American medical schools, some 100, 110 of them, I think it was, and uh, she got answers from 75% of them. And of those 75%, 75% teach nothing about hyperbaric medicine, zero. The other 25% have a part of a lecture or one lecture. 
So my generation of doctors, and still to this day, are, are really taught or informed nothing about it. They have to find it out on their own. And I went to Johns Hopkins Medical School and was told by my junior resident in my first rotation in the hospital when I overheard some doctors. We were walking through the hall. Said One of them said, uh, how about hyperbaric oxygen for this patient? And I, I waited till we were down the hall. I said, what's hyperbaric oxygen? He said, oh, it's a completely unscientific procedure, been thoroughly disproven, charlatanism, snake oil sales, and fraud. Don't ever ask about it again and don't be concerned with it. And I thought, well, okay, I got that. Eight years later, I'm in New Orleans joining a diving medicine group. I have to go learn about hyperbaric therapy. And here's all this science, and it's like, where's the disconnect here? So anyways, getting back, though, to what it does and, and the process uh, effect on inflammation. Inflammation is probably the dominant driver of so many chronic diseases. Uh, our immune system, our immune system, let's say, gone awry or been stimulated in in an odd fashion by some offending agent, chemical, uh, injury, you name it. Um, the beauty of hyperbaric oxygen is that one of its dominant, effect, dominant effects is on inflammation. It is anti-inflammatory. And this was not quite appreciated as much until 2008 when uh, an experiment was done by Dr. Cassandra Godman up in Massachusetts. And Dr. Godman took uh, skin biopsies from patients who were, you know, having like a mole biopsy. And they extracted normal tissue and took the cells that line the tiniest blood vessels in, our, in the tissue. They're in our entire body. And they put them in a Petri dish, put them in a hyperbaric chamber, and gave them a single hyperbaric treatment, and did a mass gene array analysis for 48 hours. At the end of 24 hours, 8,101 of our 19,000 protein coding genes in our 23 chromosomes were either significantly turned on or turned off, suppressed by that single hyperbaric treatment. And the largest clusters that were turned on were the anti-inflammatory genes and the growth and repair hormone uh, genes. And the largest clusters suppressed were the pro-inflammatory genes, the ones that cause inflammation. So this therapy, unbeknownst to everybody, except the people who have used it, experienced it for a condition where inflammation is present, is probably the most elegant, panoramic, wide-ranging, and longest-known anti-inflammatory therapy known to man. So when they say, you know, you, you see these commercials on, on a, a new drug that's come out and they're trying to do some gene therapy, they're manipulating a handful of genes. When, when this is true, it doesn't make, make a lot of sense that we have not, this is not widely used. And, uh, and so, hence, that's why I could not believe all of the, you know, at, the, at that medical conference in Albuquerque, all of the different indications, you know, were discussed there. There's so many. And, 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 and as I say, you know, with, with the presenters, the doctors, the scientists that were presenting them, that there were, you know, there were hundreds, if not thousands of dots on the graph, which were people. And, and so this was not just a small sample. There, there was a lot of research that was presented there. And, yes. And, 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 uh, and I think that was, you know, as you've mentioned um, in our discussion today, earlier before, before the program, was that that might have been the first time you brought that to a conference and you talked about it was in Albuquerque. And, and I, think, I think you mentioned that even in your book. Yeah. Uh, it, I mean, it was such a eureka moment when I mean, there was the indication for that. But now here we had gene evidence with human endothelial cells. And our endothelial cells that line our tiniest blood vessels are the most reactive in the human body. And think of it, that's where much of our disease takes place, is at the tissue level with the tiniest blood vessels there. It's where all inflammation takes place, uh, or at least the majority of it, um, and so much disease pathology. So uh, yes, to have something that could affect so many different diseases, that actually has been one of the biggest criticisms of hyperbaric medicine that uh, there was an extremely critical article written by uh, a prominent um, pulmonologist in 1987. Uh, and he wrote it, he was the editor of the most prominent journal, Chest. 
And uh, he and his medical student wrote this article, and it was hyperbaric oxygen therapy, uh, a therapy in search of a disease. And they listed 132 or 139 diseases that people had claimed uh, hyperbaric oxygen had been applied to successfully. And uh, when you, in, the, in my book, I talk about how this is a, a, a very generic treatment, and we can talk about this later, how it addresses things at a very basic level that you can, if you're a creationist, we were created to be sensitive to oxygen and pressure changes. If you're an evolutionist, we evolved every living organism to be sensitive to changes in pressure and oxygen. And it's an adaptability phenomenon. But, uh, you know, what became evident is that when you looked at all of these diseases, they are all wounding conditions of one type or another. And wound used in the broad sense that any insult to the human body induces tissue injury. And with that, there is inflammation. It is inescapable. It's like plugging a DVD in and it runs the same way every time, the inflammatory reaction. And the beauty is that hyperbaric oxygen can impact that inflammatory reaction at any place along the spectrum. It's interesting. And with many diseases as well, a result. And you know, when you, you hear about different diseases and even drugs, you, you, you see or you hear the word inflammation is thrown in very often. Yes. You know, that, that a drug, in fact, you're taking a drug that it could cause inflammation. So you can get an inflammatory response from this foreign chemical being put into your body. And, exactly. You know, one of the things that, that you know, when I left that first conference after, after hearing your lecture is that I started reading these, these clinical trials and these studies. And hyperbaric oxygen, of course, there's, I, th I think you gave a number of 40,000 you know, in, in, that, in that first conference that I went to, that there were 40,000 published articles and studies that were out there. It was, a, it was a big number, I know that, more than I could ever, you know, um, um, read in, that, you know, in, a, in, a, you know, in a reasonable amount of time, of course. And so, so what I found is no matter what the indication, it, there was always that, that word, inflammation. And it yes. seemed like inflammation was what you just said earlier. It's one of the drivers for, for all these diseases. So I had met somebody um, that was interested in our hyperbaric discussions and uh, she was the chair, or she is the chairman of the National Science Board. So presidential appointee, lives in Chapel Hill, Prava Fernandez. So we, we would meet at, at, at uh, Whole Foods for, for hours and just talk. And so I said one time to uh, Prava, and so she has her PhD in uh, microbiology, I think is it, and, and, and developed, invented some, some an antibiotics. And mm -hmm. so I said to Prava, I said, you know, it seems like we, we all die of inflammation. And she said, oh, that's, that's true. She said, we all die of inflammation, no matter what it is. So, so to your point, why aren't we using it for everything? And of course, we tell a doctor that or anybody that, they glaze over and they say, oh, there's nothing that can do that. But isn't it the essential element of life, oxygen and pressure? Without it, we wouldn't exist. Yes, yes. And the problem is people don't know about it, and that's why we're doing this today. Um, you know, the anti-inflammatory effects of hyperbaric oxygen are just wide-ranging. And uh, it's an undeniable fact. And so many diseases. So it, it doesn't matter. I like to tell people whether you have, let's say, just take the brain, a chemical insult to the brain or a lack of oxygen, lack of blood flow, um, a toxic drug reaction that affects the brain, uh, an immunologic reaction, autoimmune type of reaction in the brain. All of them involve some type of, although the immune reaction is <laughs> the immune inflammation itself, but uh, I mean, any type of uh, trauma uh, you know, to the brain, any of them will induce some tissue damage and then it's uncontrollable. There's gonna be an inflammatory reaction. Uh, and in fact, that was one of my kind of eureka moments, if you will, early in hyperbaric medicine, when we were treating these divers. Uh, and when, you know, if you look at decompression sickness, uh, the signature diagnosis for this specialty, uh, the world's Navy's experience, who really kind of dominated this field for many years, 
report that if you can get someone in a chamber within one hour of coming out of the water when they're symptomatic with decompression sickness, the first hyperbaric treatment is curative in 90% of cases. Well, as I got into this more and more and started exploring it, all of the animal experiments show that the bubbles, at least for the brain, go through the brain in the first five minutes. And the presumption has always been we're treating bubbles. Well, what happens is the bubbles go through the brain and they damage the inside lining to the small blood vessels in the brain. Now you have an inflammatory reaction on the inside of the blood vessels in the brain and it clots them off. Well, if you, it turns out, give that treatment to animals where you've removed all of the white blood cells and shoot bubbles through their brain, they have no damage. The bubbles go through and they're fine afterwards. The reality is what we have been doing, what the US Navy, what all the world's navies have been doing for all of these years in treating brain decompression sickness was not treating bubbles in the brain. They were treating inflammation, the inflammatory reaction in the brain after the bubbles passed. So here we are with the signature diagnosis for this specialty for how many years? Well over a hundred. And the root of it was we're treating inflammation. Well, it's, it's, it's just amazing that <laughs> it's, it's amazing for me that this is not used widely. Yes. It's sad. Um, and uh, one, one of the, um, one of the things that, that, that I really enjoyed in the book is that you cover a lot of um, the indications that, uh, that you've treated. And, and so you have some substantial experience with that. One of the lists that I printed out was um, that the extensive list that you referred to about all the indications that they right. say internationally. So something that I want to make sure that we cover through, through this, um, this series of conversations is is the international indications that, um, in fact, I think uh, Mal Hooper from Australia had this on his website. We started with that and we worked on it, but I know you cover a number of these in your book. And so I think it's gonna be important for us to cover as many as we can so that, that the you know, people watching this really understand the value of, of what you're talking about and what might apply to them. Right, well, what people have to realize is that hyperbaric oxygen therapy is not a treatment for diseases. People have always thought that, and that's the way it got defined in the United States as a disease-specific treatment. It's good for X, Y, Z, these 13 diagnoses. The reality is it's a treatment for disease processes, the processes that cause the diseases. And these are basic processes that, that are present in many, many diseases. So, and that's why hyperbaric oxygen can be applied to so many of them, such that that critical article from 1987 that said, you know, look, 132 or 139 diagnoses hyperbaric oxygen been applied to. In my book, I said, well, that may actually be a conservative number. <laughs> we may have application to many more diseases than that. And if you look at them, you can really, the vast majority of them can be understood as wounding conditions. This is a treatment for wounds in any location and of any duration. So can I paraphrase that? Of course you can. Stop the bleeding and let hyperbaric oxygen do the healing. Yes. So you still gotta stop the bleeding. You do. It, it doesn't do everything. That's right. Okay, thank you, Dr. Harch.